Climate. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm very glad to see here the climate gang um, in Washington and beyond. I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development. We have some movers and shakers. I see Tim Worth back there. Aren't you going to sit at the table, Tim? No? Gonna, You're going to... Uh, yeah, right. Okay. It's okay. Sorry I have to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I am very pleased to welcome Professor William Nordhaus. Uh, I'm going to tell a quick anecdote. He might not remember, but I know he has a daughter who's in her mid to late 30s, and that's because he was the distinguished professor already many years ago when I was a student doing my PhD at Yale. So I've followed his uh, contributions closely, particularly on climate over the years. And I'm very much looking forward to learning what he has to say today. I have to learn about it because, like Tim, I have to go to New York. So, oh, I'm so pained. I need to leave in 20 minutes. I'm very disappointed uh, about that. With that, I think I turn it over to Chris for more climate-related introduction. Well, thanks very much, uh, Nancy. Uh, and welcome, everyone, uh, for joining World Watch and CGD at today's event. Uh, the, the genesis of, of the gathering uh, was really a, a sense that, that a number of us, both at World Watch and CGD, have had in, in recent uh, weeks that given uh, the failure of Congress to enact legislation uh, last year, uh, given uh, the somewhat uncertain nature of, of international negotiations, uh, things are sort of up in the air in a way they've never been before. And so while the question of political feasibility has always been, a, in the past couple of years, a, a very quick way of, of stopping a lot of broader arguments about what is the right way forward on, on climate policy, because we're now in a world where, at least in Washington, it seems that virtually nothing is politically feasible uh, in, in this sphere, uh, it seems like this is a, a great time, really, to have a, a truly honest discussion among people that are, that are well-informed and, and knowledgeable about, about possible options uh, for the way uh, forward. And I hope we can not only focus on, on the U.S., uh, but I think it's equally important to, to be talking about what kinds of policies might be adopted by other countries uh, that are considering new climate policies, but also, as, as, as Bill Nordhaus has argued in, in a recent article, uh, for possible structures uh, for uh, the international regime uh, going forward. And I guess one of the things that that has really sort of intrigued me, and I think is really, you know, sort of less understood than it should be uh, here in Washington. And if you look around the world, but particularly if you look in Europe at the range of policy mechanisms that have been put in place, uh, even in Europe, which, which arguably has the, the, the most robust uh, and largest emissions trading system in the world, a number of European states actually have uh, quite significant uh, greenhouse gas emission or carbon taxes or related kinds of energy taxes implemented in recent years where there's be become, been some significant experience, um, you know, perhaps positive as well as, as negative. Uh, but, but I think it's, 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 you know, really clear if you simply look at the record that there are a lot of different approaches being pursued, um, you know, ranging from pure emissions trading to pure carbon taxes, often covering different sectors of the economy in the same country. And, and there's probably going to be some benefit, particularly given we're now at a time in the United States where there is at least as much likelihood of action at the state level as at the federal level to look at the possibility of, of, of different options and perhaps hybrid models, combinations of things. And I think as most of you probably know at this point, uh, Bill Nordhaus has been very active uh, in writing and arguing for the efficacy of, of carbon taxes and, and, and charges and, and has done some very interesting uh, thinking on these issues, perhaps uh, going a bit against the grain in terms of what's been considered in Washington recently. But again, as I said earlier, I think this is a, is a time to get all of the, the most effective interesting ideas on the table, and I'm sure we're going to have a very lively conversation with a lot of, of pushback. Uh, but now it's up to you. Bill to, to get this conversation going. I'm going to make one more um, uh, interruption to remind myself and all of you, and especially my former professor, 
Why is the Center for Global Development talking about U.S. and European and other countries' uh, climate policies? And it is because we have come to see, including because of Bill Klein's work and others, David Wheeler's work, it's a disaster, not only in waiting but now, for the poor and vulnerable in the world. And that's, so that's the context for us. It may not come up directly today, but what, ma what we do here does matter for millions of people and for the next generations to come, too. So we really are looking for ways, politically, to make progress on the, what, what, what countries should do who have systemic, whose, whose behavior has systemic effects around the world. Okay. Will, do you have the projector control? Let me shut the lights down. So is there sound back there? I think we have sound. Are you can okay? You back there okay? Oh, well, okay. Here's your control. Thank you very much. And I'll talk up here so you can see the screen rather than my shadow on the screen. Well, thanks uh, both to Nancy and Chris and to the to the centers for inviting me. It's a it's a great pleasure to be here. I spend most of my talk, time talking to people at the other at the other places at a young age distribution who actually have no idea what political realities are or what they're thought to be, and so it's a it's a real treat to come here. Uh, so I want to talk about, I'm just going to talk really directly about the issue of carbon taxes. I think I'll skip through the beginning because this crowd knows most of it. Um, and I, I, and one, of the, one thing I want to say at the very beginning is I th my view is informed and, and really driven by the fact that this is a global issue, needs a global solution, and the mechanisms that we introduce have to be ones that are at least consistent with a wide range of applications. So I think I will actually skip, so I'm not going to, you know about the current international approach called the Kyoto Protocol, you know about the Copenhagen meeting, uh, just, just one word on that, a couple of words on that, um, that basically there was at least the appearance for the first time of agreement of a target, two degree C temperature target. Um, However, unlike Kyoto, there were no binding agreements on emissions, although there were what you might call aspirational targets of countries. All countries made some kind of uh, statement, and um, uh, although it wasn't, they weren't binding targets. Uh, there were lots of uh, unsolved problems at the end of uh, the Copenhagen meeting. What are the targets? Will the U.S. participate? What will the middle-income countries do? what mechanisms will be used to encourage reductions in poor countries, and then how will those be paid for. Uh, I, I think Chris already talked about some of the issues in U.S. climate change. Even though the U.S. played a central role in the first negotiations, um, it, with the, with the, well, it, it never got off the ground here. And I, I won't say it crashed, but it just never got off the ground. Um, there was a House bill, as you know, in 2009 didn't pass the Senate. And I think from my point of view, the thing I want to just note is that all U.S. bills uh, that have gotten a double-digit number of votes uh, have firmly endorsed a cap-and-trade approach to U.S. policy. Uh, all of them actually also had heavy regulatory burdens. Some of them had tra trade sanctions in them. And all of them had allocation of permits, although some of them, in, some of them uh, encouraged uh, auctioning at some point. Okay. So uh, I think you know, I'm not going to go into this again in detail, that Kyoto is not living up to its aspirations. Um, and, uh, you know, we're 14 years after the, the, the uh, Kyoto meeting. And uh, as I'll show you a little bit, it's um, a little bit later, it really has not, um, has not lived up to its aspirations. Now, but before, I want to talk about a little bit about the economics. I just have two things I want to say about economics before I get into the comparisons. And these are what I call uh, the two inconvenient economic truths. They're, they're inconvenient because most people don't want to hear them. But uh, if you look at the economic literature in this area, um, two things come out. One is, uh, I'd say, just obvious from the first moment. Since 
global warming is a p global public good, then basically you're going to have to have um, uh, a market price on carbon. And because you have billions of consumers and millions of firms and thousands of governments, um, you're going to have to have it at a decentralized level. You're going to have to have consumers, firms, and governments facing a market price of carbon if you're going to have eff efficient and effective emissions reductions. I think that is pretty, well, m economists tend to believe that and uh, think that very strongly, and I think that's gradually percolating through the community of, of people who are concerned. And there are lots of reasons we go into those, but I think I don't want to do that here. Then the other thing which is actually a little more surprising, I think, is that given the structure of the costs of emission reduction, it turns out that you really have to be efficient. You're going to have to have a policy which is nearly universal. I don't mean universal across rich countries, but even through the middle-income countries and some of the big um, low-income countries. It, the price will have to be universal. That's to say you'll have to have a price of carbon facing lot, lots of countries and also will need to be harmonized. That's to say you can't have wildly different pri You can't have zero prices in half the world and wildly different prices in different countries and in different sectors. Now, uh, if you look at the policies to implement these, there, there are, well, let's say two above the line and two below the line. Above the line meaning something that might possibly work and below the line, in my view, being basically hopeless. So the two that are, uh, as you know, that have been talked about are an internationally harmonized carbon tax and the universal cap and trade. The Kyoto, at least in its extended form, if it were extended around the world, would be a universal cap and trade. I'll say a little about what I mean by a harmonized carbon tax in a minute. But um, below the line, there are also lots of things which could be done, could be introduced, have been introduced, are often part of uh, the policies to accompany or to implement uh, uh, climate change policies. One is uh, regulatory substitutes. Uh, the things like cafe standards, uh, what the what the what the antis call light bulb socialism, um, and things like that. And these turn out uh, there's a there's a vast literature on this, and it turns out they may be effective, they may be ineffective, but they're an inefficient substitute, an inefficient substitute for a price based policy. And then there, there are other things which are even further down the list, ought to be off the page probably, which are voluntary measures such as carbon offsets. Uh, and these are just, we've got all kinds of problems. They're difficult to calculate, they're difficult to verify, and they're probably just uh, divert people from uh, useful activities. So uh, what, do we mean, what do I mean by a harmonized carbon tax? So again, I want to I emphasize here I'm going to talk about the, the ideal type. I'm going to talk about uh, what a policy would be um, that, we sh that we should aim for. Now, uh, obviously, uh, I recognize that nothing is going to be perfect and that uh, it's, we're never going to get to the ideal harmonized carbon tax. But I, I think it's a useful thing to keep in mind because I think it is what we should aim for. And in a way, it's, it's a little bit like free trade. We know we're never going to get to free trade. I mean, there's always going to be somebody doing something, and there'll be some safeguards, and there'll be some office in Poitiers where somebody's doing regulating. But it's something we want to keep in mind as, as something we can aim for, something we can think about, something we could uh, design. So what is it? Uh, well, uh, I'd say five things. First, uh, the prices of all uh, greenhouse gases, uh, mainly CO2, but others as well, uh, would be uh, set, set through taxation or some other, but in this particular through taxation, proportional to their, actually not their carbon content, but their greenhouse warming potential. Uh, and for CO2, it's really relatively straightforward. For some of the others, it's a little more complicated. But CO2 is basically pretty straightforward. All countries would levy a comparable tax. Uh, that's to say at the same rate. Uh, now, 
you could ask what the level of the tax is. I'll show you a slide in a second, which suggests you know, it's going to depend a little bit on what your environmental target is. But if you want a two degree, you can have one thing. If you want a three degree, you want another. If you think you can do a cost benefit analysis, you might do something else. If you want, like the Bill Klein's costs and benefits, he will he will tell you what the appropriate tax schedule will be. Uh, now, this is my own view, but I think it's actually pretty important. My view is that countries should retain all the revenues domestically, uh, that this is a domestic tax. I mean, the domestic tax in the sense that it's set domestically, the revenues are collected domestically, and it's not an international transfer pro program. I think to turn it into an international transfer program would be the end of it. And then one of the very important points about a carbon tax is that it, it can be used to replace uh, existing taxes or reduce fiscal deficits. So particularly in a, in a world where um, people are very concerned about fiscal debts and deficits, uh, it actually has an important role to play. Uh, Alan Blinder, you may have seen, wrote a very interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal advocating a carbon tax, a very, very high one, by the way, uh, as a way of uh, basically putting a pretty big dent on the, on the U.S. budget deficit. Now, there are lots of open issues. Uh, one is how to treat trade. I, I probably won't talk about that, but might come back to that. And then another one is how do you treat low-income countries and how do they migrate into the system or do you have transfers to help them uh, enter the system? Uh, just to give you some idea of what a carbon tax might look like, so these are some model calculations. Um, there are actually now about a dozen models where you can say do this, do that, and the model will tell you what a carbon tax would be. There's a whole set of um, energy modeling forum which have done similar experiments, but I'll just, since I know my own stuff and I know what lies behind it, this, this is from a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year in which I estimated both an economic cost-benefit optimum and what, what it would take to get a, a two-degree C limit. Uh, these are per ton carbon, so roughly divide them by four if you want, if you think in terms of tons of CO2. Uh, and so you, you're getting, you would get, say, in terms of, uh, let's do tons of carbon uh, over the next, and say you were to so, think of something for the next decade, you'd be talking in the, in the order of 30 to $40 a ton of C or for a cost benefit, or if you wanted a two degree C limit, you'd be talking about 70 to $80 per ton of C to stay within a two degree limit. Now these are global averages. I have to emphasize this. If you just put it in place in one country, uh, it's not good. you know if, if Europe has a hundred dollars a ton that's not going to get you very far because Europe is not not large enough now uh, what I want to do next in the in the next few minutes is talk a little about the comparison of cap and trade I think you know about cap and trade you actually know about carbon taxes too but I think some of the issues that are raised are not real well known and uh, so I want to discuss those okay so um, what are some problems well, I think one of the things I would emphasize is that cap and trade is a new and untested system in the international environment. Um, it's, uh, I really want to emphasize that it's, it's something that has been tried in countries. It is now just starting in Europe. Uh, so it has actually been tried in what I'd call well-regulated, mature uh, political and, and uh, bureaucratic systems, systems with strong organizational governmental structures, um, but it, it's, um, it's really contentious. And I think well, I won't say, I, I, I might say this, I might have said this, but I didn't put it on my slide. I just think if you, say you're very concerned, as Nancy uh, said, sh said earlier, about climate change, uh, would you want to trust the climate policy to something as untested as a cap and trade system? Um, something that really has never been harmonized across countries, really sovereign countries. I think you'd really want to think about that very carefully. Now, taxes are a very mature system, so they've been around for a long time. Uh, we know how they work. We know their pluses and minuses. We know people hate them. Um, but uh, we know what they are. We know the animal. Now, a second uh, point is about the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, I, I don't know if everybody recognizes how much attrition there's been in the Kyoto Protocol over the since, uh, well, since 19, 1997. Uh, but this gives you some idea. So what I've done on the left there, just have a 
This doesn't have a thing, does it? Oh, it's that a thing. Oops. No. Oh, okay. yeah, it is a laser pointer. It's the, this one? Okay. It's that top button there. Okay, thank you. Well, let's see if I can get it to work here. No, it's it too, okay. So basically this shows the share of emissions of what of all of the countries in the Kyoto Protocol, all of them less the U.S., and what I call the enthusiasts. Those are the, peop the countries of Northwest Europe. And so when it was passed, there were about almost two-thirds of emissions were covered by the protocol. If you move forward to last year, uh, well, first place, you'd had uh, – a big growth in developing countries, so even if everybody included, the number would have gone down. The U.S. dropped out, and actually there are not very many, there are actually a lot of non-enthusiasts about it. So if you actually look last year, there were only, I would say, roughly 10 percent of countries ranked by emission, in terms of emissions were real enthusiasts. I think one of the things it suggests is that this is not a friendly system. Countries don't look and they say, oh my God, that's a club I want to, I want to join. It's not like the EU. Uh, countries are just dying to get into the EU. Countries are not dying to get into the Kyoto Protocol. Um, okay. uh, this gives you some idea of what um, global emissions reductions are likely to look at if you actually followed the pre Kyoto Protocol as, as des originally designed. So this gives you some idea of global emissions reduction. They're, they're essentially, they're very, very close to zero. This gives you some idea of what you would need to meet the two degree C target. So the big point is you're really a long, long, long way away from our aspirational targets. So second, a second point, uh, which I think is not a surprise to economists, but maybe is a surprise to a lot of people, is that these quantity type regulations tend to have extremely volatile prices. So this shows you just one example. These are the uh, these are the CO2 prices in the European trading system, and these are two vintages of prices. The first one was the first phase, and that obviously that went to zero because there were excess, but then the second one is the second phase. And you can see they, they, they are highly volatile. So, for example, you have this period in the financial crisis. It's really interesting, actually, from, from an economist's point of view. Uh, you have the financial crisis here, and the price went from 30 to 8 over the course of the financial crisis. Well, so it says, well, maybe something happened, maybe this, that, the other thing. Well, actually, no, this, these, are, these are like a, another asset that crashed. So you might ask, do you want CO2 prices to crash just because there's a financial problem? Well, probably not. Um, another reaction, I saw, I've, I've shown something like this before, and people say, oh, well, that's because it's such an immature system. Once it gets mature, actually, that's what they said when I first started talking about this in this period, that's what they said, oh, no, it's going to mature. Look, it's actually stabilizing. Look how stable it's been. And then, of course, it crashed. Uh, well, I think the point is that it's intrinsic to a cap-and-trade type system that the prices are going to be volatile. Because you have inelastic supply, and you have quite inelastic demand, and you put those two together, and you have volatile prices. Now you can you can you can maybe modify that with banking and borrowing and other things, but the best you you see it also in the SO2 system. Now you might say, well, okay, what's what's the problem with volatility? Well, the problem with volatility is it actually it discourages investment. It, it puts a, it it raises the price of investment. So if you're going to invest in CO2 abatement, it raises the price of that. So there's some technical economic issues. I don't talk about these in. Uh, in uh, sort of mixed company usually, mixed economists and others. Um, but I would like to mention that it, there's three technical issues that are pretty important. One is um, that if you're going to have a, a system like this which is going to raise prices, then it's actually pretty important from the overall efficiency of your fiscal system to do it in a way that raises revenues. That's to say, it could be auctioned. So auction, if you're really going to auction it off 100% with no slippage, then then that's equivalent to taxes. But if you're going to allocate them, then you're losing revenues, and it's making your fiscal system more inefficient. Then there's a really, really technical issue of what I'll call Weizmann uncertainty, but I think I will just pass over that. And then the final point is one about uncertainty in thresholds. So if you think there's a threshold so that we, we're going to somewhere 2.3 degrees C, there's some very, or uh, 
456 parts per million, there's some threshold and we're going to cross it and some terrible things are going to happen, then it's clear that some kind of quantity um, limits are, are advantageous. But you have to, but it's, it's, it's a very limited set of circumstances when that's it. And one of the circumstances that you, you can't have resets, that you can't say you set the tax and if it's wrong, you reset it. So you, and the other is you have to be able to limit the thing you're actually limiting. So if you're limiting emissions, that doesn't actually bring you a quantity target that would be relevant. But I would say that that's one of the disadvantages of, of just using a price is if you have these very, very uh, well-defined thresholds, then they're not the appropriate target. They're not the appropriate mechanism. Okay. Now, since uh, I'm sorry, Nan Nancy left because this was mainly for well, not mainly this was really for her. And actually, I do something I never do, which is I actually wrote something out word for word because I think it's not really appreciated. So, I think if we think of this in the um, in a global context, we're thinking: Are we going to introduce this not just in well-managed democracies like U.S., Japan, and, and Western Europe, but Eastern Europe and Russia? and Southern Europe, and Asia, and maybe even Africa. So we've got to ask what kind of, what, is there any difference between these two systems? And I think people, and people who thought about it, particularly in the context of international trade regimes and tariffs and quotas, thought about this a lot, actually. And the common view I learned from John a long time ago, well, not that long, in the big scheme of things, uh, was the real disadvantage of quotas or quantitative restrictions as opposed to tariffs. Okay. So, Lord, yes. I'm sorry, you know, if you stand by the mic, we can hear you better. Oh, I'm very sorry. Sorry. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Apologize. I'm very sorry. No, I'm I'm very sorry, and I apologize. I like, I, I sometimes wander. So let me just let me just say this out. So, and this is a final question, which is about the administration of programs in a world where governments vary in terms of honesty, transparency, and effective administration. Quantity type systems are much more susceptible to corruption than price type systems. And why is this? An emissions trading system creates valuable trading, tradable assets in the form of these tradable, internationally tradable emissions permits and allocates these to countries. It is printing money. It is actually turning over money. You might as well just give greenbacks. There, there's some constraints on them, but they're the same. Limiting emissions creates a scarcity where none previously existed, and in essence prints money for those in control of the permits. Such wealth creation is dangerous because it, the value of the permits can be used by the country's leaders for non-environmental purposes rather than to reduce emissions. And if the oil ministers in corrupt countries pocket oil export revenues, why don't why wouldn't permit ministers, whoever they are, not pocket the permit revenues? Now, by contrast, a price approach gives much less room for corruption because it does not create artificial scarcities. There are no permits handed over, so they can't be sold abroad for wine or guns. And any revenues would have to be raised by taxation on domestic consumption of fuels. And in fact, a carbon tax would add absolutely nothing to the instruments that countries have today. Countries can already do it. There will be no more room for corruption with a carbon tax than there is today. And as I mentioned earlier, the dangers of quantities as compared to price approaches have been shown time and again in international trade interventions. And I'll just tell one final story. My colleague Ernesto Cedillo, when he negotiated or participated in the negotiation of NAFTA, said the most important thing they did was get rid of the QRs, the quantitative restrictions. That was the most important single thing that Mexico did. Now, okay, so that's, that's the basics. I think I'm just about done. Uh, I realize that, um, so Chris, Chris alluded earlier to hybrids, so since he did, I will talk us about hybrids. I realize that um, taxes are not popular. 
on the other hand, people thought cap and trade, you're going to hide from the people that those are tax, that those are tax like instruments. And now people said, well, those are really taxes. So that the cat, that cat's out of the bag. But uh, it might be that, uh, that hybrids have um, some advantage. Now, in some respects, hybrids uh, are technically slightly better, a little more because they're they're kind of complicated nonlinear taxes. But I think they're also more difficult to to understand, and they're di more difficult to persuade people. But if I if I could propose a, a single simple addition to uh, to current approaches, it would be to propose what I call a cap and tax as opposed to a cap. And the idea is that what you do is you have quantitative limits which are buttressed by a tax as a floor and a safety valve at the top. And actually, we're moving toward that because some of the US legislation had some of that. So for example, you might auction permits, uh, but you would have a tax, say, for $20 tax as a backstop. Um, and then you'd also have the ability to get more permits at a penalty price of, say, $40 a ton. So that would be a kind of example. Now, obviously, as the 20 and 40 get closer together, then you're basically back to a tax. So this is, this is something that's, I don't think it's quite as, I don't think it's quite as good as a tax, but it's, it's much, much better than a pure, um, a pure cap and trade system. So maybe I'll, uh, there's some more things to say, but maybe in the interest of getting, that's my push, and now it's time for pushback. Okay. Well, could you uh, shut off the projector? Okay. I'm David Wheeler, senior fellow at the center, and uh, Chris and I are going to co-host, and I'm going to moderate, and uh, I'm sure there will be uh, more than a few questions and comments uh, from the floor, but... Uh, before we start that, I thought I would ask uh, Chris if you have any further reflections or comments before we uh, launch into what is bound to be a pretty lively dialogue about this. Well, let me ask a quick question, really spurred in part by, by Nancy's uh, last remarks. You know, developing countries have been, you know, in sort of a continual uh, debate with, with the industrial countries over sort of who, who takes the, the burden in terms of addressing the climate problem. And the, the argument, of course, against taking legally binding limits in developing countries has been, you know, we didn't largely cause the problem. We're still developing. You know, the, the rich countries should really bear the burden. Now, if the discussion turns to a carbon tax, how would you make the, the case to, you know, particularly the rapidly developing countries, China, India, the Middle Eastern countries, what, what is the economic case to, to make to them that they should, you know, regardless of what happens in the international regime, that they should be considering a carbon tax? Uh, Bill, would you prefer to take a number of questions and respond, or one by one? I, I, have, very limited, uh, I have very limited memory buffer, <laughs> so... One well, by one. Well, I don't say one by one, but actually that's a quite an interesting, an interesting question, so why not just, just uh, and worth, worth a little reflection. Well, um, I think there are two general answers. One is I think countries sometimes want to join in. It, well, let me back up. Many countries realize this is a major issue. If you look at uh, the the conversations that came out of the summits, the Copenhagen or the Cancun summits, uh, countries at least say that they think this is a very serious issue. Now, whether they in think they're responsible or somebody else is responsible, that's how we're going to take <coughs> efforts to solve this. That's a separate issue. But I think it is, it's the consensus on this being a serious international issue, I think, is really growing. So, most countries, therefore, would like something to be done, and they would like to, I think also, most countries would like to participate if it is not costly to them, or even if they can make money on it, but let's just say it's not costly. Now, I think the argument in favor of a carbon tax, is well, there are a few. First is, countries need revenues. Almost all countries need revenues. Uh, this is a way to raise revenues this is as good as other ways of raising revenues, and pro probably better in some sense, because it's a tax on bads rather than goods. It's a tax on something you're trying to discourage rather than something you're trying to encourage. Uh, 
And then there's some other ancillary benefits, particularly in countries that are heavily dependent on coal, that it has some pretty uh, important public health benefits. So I think if I, if I were to sit down with a country and say, let's just think of it purely from the point of view of China, and China's economic development or India's economic development, and what you need to do, I would, I would think you could say, this is not a bad tax. You know, we don't like taxes, but say we can raise this tax and lower the corporate tax uh, or labor taxes to become more competitive. I think it's a pretty persuasive case. Bill, I just had two quick questions about, uh, one about an exclusion from your slide. Um, there, were, there was a characterization of efficient and inefficient policies, but you said nothing about clean technology subsidies, which have become very popular, and certainly China and India are both engaging in that pretty heavily. So my first question is simply how do you feel about those and under what circumstances might they be justified? And second question is very specific, and that is would you tax fuels or tax emissions? Okay. Uh, one question at a time. On the first question on subsidies, um, well, I, I, my view is that you should tax bads here. And the problem with subsidizing green activity in general is there's so much green activity. I mean, if you think of how much we have, we have energy use, which is roughly 10% of the economy, and let's say those are, those are things we want, we want to discourage. So, but instead of taxing those, we encourage green things, which are the other 90% where you're basically encouraging everything. It, 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 and the political economy of subsidies is just terrible. I mean, if we look at the ethanol, it's just, we don't even know if, eth if these ethanol subsidies are increasing or decreasing CO2 emissions. It's a, it, they probably are decreasing it, but it's a close call. So I think it's just, it's just really inefficient to subsidize green activities in general. Now, the one important, uh, important exception to that is uh, uh, research development and innovation and invention in low carbon technologies. Uh, we know there's a big gap between private and social uh, benefits there and that's something that we, we should definitely subsidize in the normal way we do through tax, R&D tax credits, uh, government subsidies particularly at the basic end, uh, perhaps the ERPA kind of uh, um, plan which gets them sort of the things fall halfway in between the basic research and the and the commercialization. Yep. And how about um, tax fuels or tax emissions? Oh, that's that's uh, well, okay. So um, I think the, how do you implement a carbon tax? Well, that's actually an interesting question because if you look at one of the problems with the cap and trade system, is they were modeled on the SO2 system. So if you look at Europe, what Europe did with the emission trading scheme was it levied its, um, it levied, but it put its regulations on establishments. And really, it's just, now that might be the way you do it for SO2, but it's a completely wrong way to do it for CO2, because CO2, we know where the CO2 comes from. It comes from fuels. So the very, very simplest thing to do is you put, a, you put the tax on the carbon-based fuels proportional to the carbon content. Okay. Now, and there are lots of small details, but that's a simple answer. Fair enough. Let's open the floor. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. I meant you. Right. At the, where you got the mic. Okay. Sure. Could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, no problem. Uh, Tyler Chapman, Development Alternatives, Inc. Um, I like your view of including all different countries. Um, I'm concerned that since being a grad student in 03, I haven't seen much of a change in the view that you've taken on carbon taxes versus cap and trade. And I'm wondering, in light of the experience that we've seen in the clean development mechanism under the Kyoto Protocol, in light of what we've seen under the emissions trading scheme in the European Union, do you see some nuance in here uh, and some improvements if we were to widen the cap and trade system to a global system covering all countries, as you suggest, for carbon taxes, as well as harmonizing it um, across those different countries? Do you think that it smooths things out if you include all different countries and addresses some of those criticisms? You mean for a cap-and-trade system? For a cap-and-trade system. Well, um, I think there are two problems with a Kyoto-style cap-and-trade system. 
and the, and one of them is that countries don't want to join. And I'll give you a, and I, I alluded this t to this a little bit, but I want to, I want to spell it out a little bit. Let's say you're a medium-sized open economy, middle-income country. Maybe you're Mexico. Um, and you're asking yourself, do I want to join the system? Well, what does it mean to join the system? What it means is I've got to get in a room with a bunch of people, including some real heavyweights, like my northern partner, and I've got to agree on an emissions limit. Uh, well, the problem is that every ton is added to my cut comes out of somebody else's. So that I'm going to be leaned on really heavily and this is a negotiation I don't want to get into. I mean, this is, this is why do I want to get, I've got enough problems already. Why do I want to get into another set of negotiations over an emissions limit? So as long as I can stay out of it, I'm just going to stay out of it. Now, the, the difference, with, so that's one problem with it. And that's, I think, why you, nobody's joined it. And that's why people are leaving it, and not a single country has joined it since 1997. Now, the bigger problem, I think, of extending it is really the one of extending a cap-and-trade system to countries with weak administrative structures. And I, I spent a fair amount of time on that, and that long slide with the, with the words on it was really what I thought. I just think it's a, I just think it's, it's going to be nothing but trouble to extend something that looks like a, a cap-and-trade system where you allocate emissions to countries, you allocate countries sort of middle-income countries with weak administrative structures, uh, these, these uh, tradable, bankable uh, emissions permits. I just think that's, that's, not, that's just going to be a disaster. I, th I think it will start. We'll be there for five years, and some terrible thing will happen. Uh, somebody will have turned out to use their permits and buy guns and shoot a bunch of people down or something, and that will be the end of it. So I, I just think that's a complete dead end. So the answer is no, I don't think you can go that route. Uh, okay, so CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, is, is first place. I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I have, I, I have real doubts about its effectiveness. And I, the real, so the Clean Development Mechanism basically says, most of you know, but just in case some of you are not 100 percent clear. So, if you're India and you say, okay, well, I'm going to open a such and such a plant, or China, I'm going to open a um, say a hydro plant, replace a coal plant, then you get such and such emissions reductions. You can sell those to um, the Netherlands, and it's pretty profitable. Now, the problem everybody realizes is they look at this, how do you know that this is actually incremental? How do you actually know that they weren't going to do that hydro plant anyway? And you can't know that. It's unknowable unless there's a cap. So you have this problem that uh, you have countries that, that don't want to be in cap and trade, but we want them to sell these CDM. And I, I just think it's, it's uh, unknowable about whether these are, in fact, incremental. So I, I think that's a dead end, too. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Tim Worth, I think you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming down here. Uh, let me begin by just pleading a certain um, amount of guilt. Senator Heinz and I were the people that developed the cap-and-trade legislation as part of the uh, Clean Air Act uh, in 1990, and I was the lead negotiator for Kyoto. So my experience has been one that runs directly counter to the suggestions you've made, which is it. And my experience says to me that everything that you've said, you know, has a ring of Maybe sounding good if you say it fast enough, but I don't see how you get anything done following the suggestions you've made. I cannot see one that the world is going that the United States is going to pass a tax. I can't see that there's a possibility of getting some kind of equity between countries when you look at the U.S. at twenty-four twenty-four tons a person and India at a ton of person and getting some kind of an internationally um, agreed upon standard, so we get back to nowhere. You know, I my own view is that we're going to 
ad hoc our way through for a period of time, doing cafe standards and doing light bulbs and doing efficiency and maybe trying some other financial mechanisms. This is, however, coming from a hotbed of political feasibility and not one of a kind of modeling. But how do you, how do you answer that? What do you get done? I mean, at the end, in 10 years, what would you expect might be done with the framework that you've laid out? Well, first, I, I hope I wasn't talking too fast. I can talk more slowly if that's <laughs> more convincing, although I don't think it would be more convincing. Uh, on, um, on your great achievement, I actually think the 1990 Act was a great achievement, and I think it was in a particular place for a particular problem. It was, it wasn't, I mean, I can quarrel with some things. I would have liked to see them auction off and all that kind of economist stuff. But it actually clearly made a significant improvement in our control of, of sulfur in this country. I think the problem was that while it, that might have worked for CO2, uh, as I, to repeat a little bit, um, I won't talk too fast, but, but uh, it might have worked if the problem could be handled with a similar mechanism in the rich countries, J Japan, North America, and Western Europe. But I think one of the things that is clear is even if you have a mechanism that works in those, it's not going to solve the problem because, as I, I showed you in that slide, the rest of the world is growing too fast. So uh, what about the fact that this, so well, I guess one, one question, is this a dead end? Okay, is it, is it a dead end because uh, it's politically infeasible? Uh, well, um, I don't know, I don't know if it's more or less, I mean, is it more or less dead than cap and trade? They all, all both look pretty moribund to me. Um, I think outside the United States, I think the story is quite different. As I talk to Chinese, as I talk to Indians, and I talk to Western Europeans, and I talk to Japanese, uh, they have a different view of, of carbon tax from Americans. Um, India's actually introduced the teeny, teeny little carbon tax. And I, I will uh, I'll bet you one SO2 permit that China will have a, a carbon tax within a decade. You don't have to take that, but just I'll, I'll, I'll donate it to you if I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, now, um, on the U.S., which you know much better than I do, and I, I think there is a chance in the, just a chance, in the environment of fiscal constraints that a carbon tax, well, I know it's mentioned, I don't know if it's on the table, because I don't know what the table is. But I know it's one of the things that serious people think about when they think about how to solve our budget problems. Um, if one of the co-chairs of the Deficit Commission hadn't been for, from Wyoming, it might have been in the Deficit Commission's uh, recommendations. Who knows? And finally, I, I think that. Um, this is a long-term problem. There are lots of different places in the world that need to deal with this. And, and part of why I feel the way I do is I just I think the cap and trade is is just not going to work in these countries of the uh, with weak administrative structures. Okay, thanks, Bill. Uh, Arvin. Just uh, two or three. Oh, sorry, Arvind. Could you identify yourself just for those few who may not know who you are? Sorry, uh, Arvind Subramanian from the Pearson Institute and the Center here. Um, uh, two, two or three probably contradictory remarks. Um, one is that, you know, I used to, until, uh, say, a year ago or six months ago, uh, from an international perspective, uh, and in the interest of trying to effect transfers as a way of getting... Uh, lower income emerging markets, lower countries on board, uh, used to favor uh, a kind of international cap and trade because they're, you know, it's, it's more obscure. The transfers are more obscure, therefore more doable. You know, there's no way, uh, you know, one could envisage 
carbon taxes being transferred cross border i mean that was just but but now i've come to the view that you know uh transfers certainly to the big emerging market countries given the fiscal situation here is completely out of the question uh, uh, of any form you know through through permits or through uh, transfers so in that sense the uh, the, the relative advantage of uh, cap and trade over taxes from an international perspective gets at least leveled off. So in that sense, you know, uh, uh, taxes seem, seem no worse than cap and trade. Um, but then it, it, it seems to me that, you know, you mentioned China, for example. I was just uh, chatting today with someone from Shell who's just in, in China. They seem to be starting some pilot program on, on, on cap and trade in China. Uh, so, so the question is, I mean, uh, why do we want to get down to, you know, be very doctrinaire either way, and just, you know, if cap and trade works in China, so be it. If if taxes work here, so be it. Because it seems to me that all the corruption consequences of this, and and John is my guru here, are all second, third order compared to what you can get by by solving the emissions problem. So so in that sense it's it's difficult to be very doctrinaire either one way or the other on this. So 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 in that sense, you know, to come down on the on in terms of carbon taxes seems to me just, you know, maybe I'm just echoing what, what Tim here said, why must one be so so kind of doctrinaire uh, about this? Okay. So I I uh I don't know that I would say I'm Dr. Nair. I, 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 why, am I, why am I so emphatic? Well, if you have 30 people in the room and every one of them says cap and trade is a great idea, not too many, and say none of them are saying they're on an equal playing field and I, I do have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, well, I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to be so emphatic. Um, but if, if everyone thinks cap and trade is the right idea, everybody thinks carbon tax is politically infeasible, Every piece of legislation that's been introduced has cap and trade. The only one that induces a carbon tax has been so, by some representative you've never heard of. Um, then I think you have to emphasize some of the advantages of the one and the disadvantages of the other. Now, but let me be a little, a little more. Let me go a little beyond that. If I were to think of how uh, how to put this in terms of a, of a international negotiation, I think I would, I would agree with you, and I would actually, I didn't say that today, but I have said, I think what I'd do is do a little different. I wouldn't say you have to have a carbon tax, you have to have a cap and trade system. Remember, the, the Kyoto Protocol doesn't say you have to have a cap and trade system, but that is the Kyoto model, and that is what people are agreeing on. They're talking about quantitative emissions reductions. So what I would say is a little different thing. I would say you can have whatever system you want. Okay. You want cap and trade? Fine. You want uh, you want uh, regulate light bulbs? Fine. You want tax? You want gasoline taxes? Fine. The only thing is that you have to have a price of carbon in your economy that is at least at some minimum standard or minimum level. Okay. So if we say the minimum level is twenty dollars a ton fine and actually you cap and trade it's easy to administer because you just put a reservation price on it in the alloc in the in an auction system it's easy to do you love cap and i'm not you but if, if a country loves cap and trade fine just do it that way but the real emphasis is to move away from this system which has all the problems i, th I think i've identified toward one which is a price-based system and i think actually when people move there and they, they look at the advantages of using taxes rather than the quantitative system, they'll say, well, maybe this actually, if we're going to go that way, we might as well use the tax type system anyway. Okay, thanks. Uh, John Strand? Yes, I'm John Strand from the... I'm John Strand from the World Bank's uh, research department. Uh, I, um, uh, you uh, anticipated quite a bit the pushback here. I'm going to, not pushing back from the start here, I'm going to support you a little bit. Um, in a couple of ways. One is I'm a little bit surprised by, could not really surprised by, by the, this, by your comment that you think it's not possible to, to have a carbon tax. I think this is this is a matter of sentiment, a matter of feelings in the U.S. The T word is not a good word to use in this country. But if one looked more logically at it, I think it's a no-brainer. You know, to, there should be more taxes on on energy and. 
you, you have the, the, the energy security issues, you have uh, pollution, you have externalities, and there's you know there's a hundred different reasons for for the taxation of, of energy products in this country, which certainly go beyond the the, the carbon issue, and and it, so so there's a number of reasons for that. But of course, on a, on a global scale, I think uh, there's a number of other reasons also, and I have one reason which has not been focused so much. Uh, if you look at, think about the OPEC, the OPEC's scared to death about carbon taxes, but they're not scared to death about caps. And why aren't they? You know, because the reason is that if you put a global cap on emissions, this is effectively going to hand more power over to, to the OPEC and, and to food producers, because that's going to make it easier for them to manipulate prices. Because a, a cap doesn't really affect the price directly. It only affects quantity. And that's that. That's a a gold mine for uh, an, a monopolistic uh, producer. So, so, and that's that's an issue that hasn't really been focused much on here yet. So, I think I'm going to stop with that because I think there's a number of reasons for uh, implementing. Ta uh, finally, China, because uh, you mentioned China, and I know ch the things going on in China, and for quite some time, the Chinese were actually. Uh, thinking about uh, a tax system and the cap and trade, and they're kind of, I think they're kind of not really sure what they're going to choose. And I think the reason why they're now ending, seem to end up with, with a cap solution is just that Kyoto has a cap and, and there is, aren't any taxes. And uh, But I think the Chinese can be affected here and influenced, and, and others as well. I just thank you very much. That was a nice summary. And next time I give a talk, I will say I was giving a talk in a group who was not too enthusiastic, and somebody said, "Well, carbon tax is a no-brainer." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, Can I try one other point of clarification? <laughs> sure. Go ahead. Yeah. About the cap and trade and the tax issue. Excuse me for jumping back in again, but I think this That's is an important and little understood difference. When the sulfur dioxide program was put in place. It was a pure cap-and-trade program. There was no revenue raised in it at all. And there have been five other instances where cap-and-trade has been used in legislation. Never had it been a revenue raiser. It was a pure cap-and-then-trade program. When it came to Waxman-Markey, it was not a cap-and-trade program. It was what the Republicans said it was. It was a cap-and-tax program because, in fact, the permits in, were, instead of being allocated to the existing emitters, as it had been in the sulfur dioxide program, the permits were sold off, and there was a huge pool of revenue. Imagine to be that there would be a large pool of revenue. There was a very big difference between the original successful SO2 program and the unsuccessful Waxman-Markey program. And why was that? Because the minute you made the cap-and-trade program a tax program, it died, went right off the cliff. It became a cap-and-tax program. And it seems to me that that is further well, evidence of the fact if we ever had momentum going that there was going to be some kind of a successful revenue-raising, whatever, climate program, you know, it would have happened then, and that got absolutely drilled. The distinction between the SO2 program and the proposed cap-and-trade and, and revenue-raising program has got to be understood. It was a very, very big distinction. Final point is, I mean, we argued, a number of us argued that, you know, it was a big mistake to put the revenue-raising into the Waxman-Markey bill, and that that led to its demise. It gave the opponents a very, very good way of saying, we're opposed to this, and it, in fact, has, I think, poisoned cap and trade for a long period of time. But I think that's an important distinction because it does give you some very empirical evidence about what a tax addition can do to a piece of legislation, I think. Well, uh, I can't, I can't, it's like arguing with somebody who's in Vietnam saying, oh, no, Vietnam wasn't that bad or something. <laughs> okay. uh, I can't really argue with you on what happened. I, 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 I could really say two things. One is, I actually think it's an illusion to think that would have gotten through if 
eighty percent had been allocated or ninety percent had been allocated to whoever was the, the, the worthy parties that were going to support it. Um, I mean, they might have gotten some more support and might have gotten some more votes, but it was still um, swimming, very, very much swimming against the tide. Um, but the other thing is, I, I think, uh, is I, I've, been, I've been dealing with environmental issues for, well, I guess I started in 1977 when I was at the Council of Economic Advisors. And at that time, we were pushing something called emissions trading. And it was in a very limited framework. It was in the, in the framework of a, a company that had, say, two plants. And you, the idea is you put a bubble on those and you cap the total and you can increase one if you reduce the other. That was a, a very, very radical idea at that time and um, very much attacked from the environmental community. Um, but I think gradually it came to be accepted, and I think in a way the, the 1990 legislation, which was 13 years later, was really the embodiment of the idea that it's going to improve efficiency if you allow trading. Well, I, I, I think we're, you know, we're just going to have to, we're just going to have to wait a little longer. Maybe, maybe it'll never happen, but um, it is possible that the only way to do it in the United States is cap and trade. But I think to use that as an international model is never going to work. And again, as I talked, as I said a minute ago, it might be that you need some kind of um, different way of thinking of the international regime, which is one where there, there, are max, there are different kinds of standards and not just the cap and trade type standard. Uh, but I guess I'm hopeful that uh, over the next 20 years, as as um, people, as as the problem becomes clear the people who are the deniers just uh, become less and less credible. You see more and more what are now small signs becoming big signs, big signs becoming even bigger signs, more and more dangerous issues arising. You know, at some point, um, uh, I think it will, the, the votes will continue to go that direction. Um, and again, I just to emphasize, I think in the current fiscal environment, I, I agree with you, if we were running a budget surplus, as we were in the 1990s, it would have been much more difficult. But in the kind of fiscal circumstance we're in now, I think there's more of a chance in the United States that we can do this. Thanks. Uh, John. Uh, John Williamson? Yeah, you got the mic. Uh, yes, you've taken the words out of my mouth. Um, John Williamson at the Business Institute. <clears throat> Former professor at MIT. Can you hear? Can yes. You hear? Yeah. Um, I wanted, uh, uh, to begin with, I, I want to make one remark about what's just being said. I mean, sooner or later, this country's going to have to face up to the fact that it needs another 5% of its GDP paid in taxes. And uh, some... Speak into the microphone. If you speak right into the microphone. Uh, sooner or later, this country will have to face up to the fact that it's going to have to pay another 5% out of GDP in taxes in one form or another. And uh, I don't see that this is, that that's an argument against this. Um, that, that's really, it's a, a lack of political courage. Uh, and I, I think that uh, uh, to be told that uh, uh, it's a no-brainer that uh, one should follow the basic lines that you uh, described, I think is right. Um, but I want to, uh, there's one particular point that you made this afternoon that I want to challenge, and that's the notion that one should have a tax with no international transfers whatsoever. Um, it, it seems to me that the answer to that was given right at the beginning by Christopher Flavin, that one wants a mechanism in which countries that have not been in previous uh, uh, um, uh, previous uh, climate control uh, uh, initiatives are encouraged to come in. And uh, one could have that if one, say, gave, uh, telling each country that, uh, that was not in the, that was not um, a, a Schedule two country, technically, um, uh, that if it then raised 10%, uh, $100 in, uh, in, Climate taxes, it will get back 110, um, for example, 
because it would get the balance of an international transfer. And then the, the developing countries and the non-developing countries are roughly of equal size now. So that would presumably co cost the uh, uh, developed countries about 10% uh, of their tax revenue. Now, that runs a, it, it, it confronts Arvind's problem. It's quite true that uh, the countries that have a fiscal problem now are, by and large, they're not the developing countries. They're the developed countries. And th that's true, but uh, I think that uh, that also is a fact uh, that we're going to have to face, that uh, they have to, in some way or another, raise more revenue and f face up to that. Um, but I, I, what do you say to okay. the argument that it would be possible to, uh, or there would be advantages in terms of encouraging the uh, developing countries to enter if they were able to raise 110 cents of uh, revenue for each 100 cents they paid in? Well, I agree with you. Um, as, a, as a normative matter, I think it's a good idea that there would this there should be transfers uh, maybe this is a useful mechanism to accomplish the transfers but let me let me talk as a matter of positive economics and politics uh, let's say I'm the majority leader of the world okay and we're getting together and I'm trying to put a get together a scheme that's going to get the votes for enough people to put a treaty together. I think actually it's a, it's a safer proposition for countries to agree to, to say we're going to raise taxes on our residents and we're going to get the revenues from saying we're going to raise taxes, we're going to get 90 cents on the dollar and 10 cents is going to go somewhere else. Um, I just think that's, you know, I, I don't want to and say what's political feasible and what's not political feasible. But I, I think that raising taxes, domestic taxes for international purposes or institutions is is very hard to do. Uh, in fact, I, I think there are none. The, and the only place where you have this kind of thing is in the EU, which is a different structure. So I, ju I just think from the point of view of having something that will work, that will bring com countries on board, uh, I think you're better off if countries keep their own revenues. Thanks. Uh, Kirk. Sorry, oh, Arvin, you want to? Okay. I, I think there's one exception to the proposition that you just made, and the oil guy should know this better. In, in the 1970s, um, I think, some tax provision was fiddled uh, by U.S. Treasury in order to, uh, uh, you know, as a kind of transfer to the Saudis. Uh, for some political, uh, some poli I mean, it couldn't have been, it was basically fiddling the tax code to generate uh, an aid transfer. So, so that, just a slight historical uh, uh, exception to the rule. That, that I, but, but your general proposition is, is, is absolutely uh, okay, right. Okay, so the question is, how many cases can you come where a legislature voted on a tax where less than 100 percent, the only ones are the EU. The EU, actually, the EU has sent, has taxes that go outside, but otherwise, I think there are none. Okay, uh, Kirk. Kirk Hamilton at the World Bank. Um, a, a related question, which is, let's imagine you had an incomplete agreement. Some number of countries do use a harmonized tax, and some number do not, for whatever reasons. Um, this will raise pressure for leveling the playing field, i.e., a border tax of yeah. some sort. Uh, on carbon content, and I'd, I'd just be curious about your uh, your thoughts on that. What do you think about border taxes? I had a slide on that. Uh, the thorny issue of border tax adjustment in situations of incompletely harmonized taxes. Okay, so... Uh, Incomplete harmonized prices. I'm sorry, uh, carbon tax, uh, prices, yes, prices. Okay. But I was, I actually think I said taxes, but but it could be prices. I have to say I don't, I don't know that I, I'm actually torn on this, and I have people I respect very much who say this is this is a overridingly important issue, and um, 
you should allow exceptions and have border tax adjustments. Uh, and I have others say, don't you mess with my trade system. Uh, and I find them, I have to say, I find them both equally persuasive. <laughs> so like bird and zazz, I'm sitting there, you know, that, the story about the, the, the donkey, the two piles of hay and both of them look equally attractive and he can't make up his mind which one to eat so he starves to death. Okay, so I'm like bird and zazz, I can't make up my mind on that one. Uh, but I think, I think it's a big issue, and uh, if I could just point to where I think the issue is going to be the biggest issue, or would have been the would have been just a horrible issue, if the Kyoto Protocol had passed, was the Mexican-U.S. Uh, border. I mean, here you have an enormous volume of trade. You would have had huge differences in carbon prices on the different sides of the border, and I can't imagine that it would not have been a border tax adjustment. Okay, so then. Uh, let, let's just go the route of, uh, let's say I were to eat one, let's say I were to eat the hay that said border tax adjustment, uh, which I think is, which is, is, is reasonable. Um, so you have a border tax adjustment. How do you do it? Well, you, you put it on the carbon content of import. First place, it's a consumption, it's therefore a consumption basis carbon tax, right? like a VAT. It's a consumption basis. And so that means you levy a, an import duty on the carbon content of, of imports, and it might mean, and you have to say, does it, does it also mean you give an export rebate on the carbon content of exports? Well, I guess, I guess it does if they're going to countries that participate, but I, I f that's pretty hard to swallow and see that happening. But okay. But then the, the real question is, how far do you go in the input-output matrix in doing this? And, and uh, as, as I talk to practitioners, so do you just do fuels? Or do you do, say, electricity, which is actually not a, not a, doesn't have any carbon in it, doesn't have anything in it actually, except electrons, uh, but you, then you try to figure out what the carbon content of the electricity is. Do you do steel? And then, if any, some of you know about subsidy law in the U.S. as it's administered, I assume I, I've learned about it very painfully once. And uh, what do you do when the data are not available from the country? Uh, whose input output table do you use? Uh, it, it's 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 very it's very much a nightmare, which leads me to think it sure would be nice to have universal um, participation. But I think I think in fact I think it's going to happen if you have anything other than de minimis carbon taxes or prices. Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt again, but it, it's actually much worse than that because then you have rules of origin, and then you say well even from Malaysia. Do you go plant by plant or by just by country? It gets much worse than that, actually. And that's why, if I may say, Aditya Matu and I have a paper saying, just do it on the, if you're going to do it, do it on the basis of the carbon content of domestic production. So do a production concept? Yeah. Okay. So I, it reminds me, actually, you're, I, I hadn't even thought of the, of the point you made, and it reminds me of the wonderful story about... Uh, What's in the iPod? Does anybody know that this is wonderful? Somebody looked and saw what's in an iPod, you know, the $300 of the iPod that says made in China. And, you know, like there's $5 of China, and basically there are 169 parts from 65 different countries. And, and, and that's, we think, we're not really sure. So it really makes the point that if you actually, particularly in well, electronics happens because of the free trade agreement, happen to be a particularly tough case, but if you have things that come from export and re-export, then you're actually never going to be able to, to track it down. Well, I, uh, so that's, a, that's an, I hadn't actually thought of, use of, of that as being so overwhelmingly difficult that you should go to a production principle. Okay. Uh, Lawrence McDonald. Um, Lawrence McDonald. I lead our communications and policy outreach work here. I want to thank you for a very clear presentation. Um, it seems to me that we're sort of dancing around the question of political practicality. At various times we say, well, you know, that's really politically unfeasible. At other times we say we're not going to talk about whether it's feasible or not. So let's say I'm totally sold on carbon taxes. I could see two ways that they might happen. One way is that we had really courageous leadership, talking now in the U.S., that would say to the electorate, you know, we will abolish the um, social security tax uh, and then we'll replace it with a carbon tax. Just make a clear deal, and then you would basically do it over the screams of the fossil fuel companies, over their opposition. You'd build a coalition, 
uh, they were of, of interest that would overcome the vested interest. I think the best chance we had for that was President Obama, who now doesn't even use the C word. He's totally stopped discussing climate. So I don't think we're going to get a grand bargain. So then I come back to, can I ask you know, our uh, economist friends and experts to come up with a carbon tax that the fossil fuel companies would love? And it may be impossible, but is there some sort of rebate or, you know, can you go away and think about coming up with a carbon tax that would achieve our goals of reducing emissions that these vested interests would embrace? Maybe it's an impossible tax, but if we can't have one like that, I don't think we're going to get a tax. Well, that's a really good point. First, let me just say I'm an economist, and whenever economists say this is politically feasible or politically infeasible, I say, do you have a degree? Have you ever been elected to Congress? Because if you don't, if you have a degree in political science, if you don't, please don't tell me what's politically feasible because you don't know. So I don't know. But uh, I'll talk a little, say something about the economics. First, in terms of a carbon tax or a cap, cap and trade in this country, uh, what we're talking about is the coal industry. We're not, talk, we're not talking about natural gas. Natural gas is probably neutrally affected by a carbon tax. Oil is a little more complicated. But there again, it's not absolutely clear whether the, the price of oil would go up or would go down with the carbon tax because you have, on the one hand, the price of energy products going up, but on the other hand, you have the price of this coal as a substitute going up more than the price of oil. So it's actually not clear how, uh, and I don't know whether oil companies know this. I mean, they've got some pretty smart people, but maybe... Maybe they know it, maybe they don't, but I think the economic evidence is the main effect is coal, the main effect on demand and the main effect on price. And I think the way, the way I would think of it is we're basically putting the coal industry out of business. And we've somehow, whether, whether we're going to say that, in, I know this is public, but whether we're going to say that in public or not, I don't know. But that, we're, not, we're not actually killing natural gas and we're not killing the oil industry, but the... The plan, either cap and trade, as Tim Worth wanted it, or as in the Obama proposal, or the House proposal, or the Senate proposal, or a carbon tax, such as the Alan Bliner proposal, those would reduce oil production by 90 percent. I'm sorry, coal. coal production by 90 percent. Sorry, thank you. Coal production by 90 percent. So I think from a, political, from a political economy point of view, we have to figure out how we're going to make a transition to essentially a zero coal economy, and um, how we will, and, and that's a big issue. We have what, fifty thousand coal miners. We have a lot of communities that, uh, not that many actually, but a few. Fifty thousand, not a lot of workers, um, actually. Um, but we'd have to find a way to really help make that transition. And I think actually we'd be better off if we could do that rather than. Figure out all these other all these other plans. I, I, one thing I I should have said when Tim just another thing on on the issue of allocation. Larry Gould, who is a very distinguished economist at Stanford, asked the following question: If you take a cap and trade, how many what fraction of the permits do you have to allocate to the energy industry to offset their profit losses? Answer, about 15 percent. One five. One five. Okay. So 100 percent allocation is a lot more than you need. Okay. So actually, you'd be better off. And since actually all, most of that 15 is is mainly coal and coal derived products or services, what you really be better is doing zero allocation and taking a tiny and taking a small part of that revenue, which is a lot of revenue, and helping with a kind of you know, it's like a uh, uh, TRA uh, for inter trade, uh, trade, trade, adjustment. trade adjustment assistance, TAA, trade adjustment assistance. And, and uh, I think that would be a much more efficient way of doing it. But I think we kind of, one other thing, if you do this over 30 years or 20 years or 10 years, um, that's a pretty gradual period. I mean, we're not talking about the, the kinds of price shocks we saw with oil in the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, and this year, there are much smaller price shocks in terms of the impacts of on an annual basis. Um, but I, I, th I think we do need to really focus where the where the where the impact is. <laughs>
if I could just a very, very quick follow up on that. Yeah. I think you answered my question in, in an unexpected way, which is if we could split the oil companies from the coal, given your analysis of the relative impact of the tax, because my sense is that most of the political spending and certainly most of the advertising spending is coming from the oil companies. And if you looked at which politicians are being backed by which firms, you might then have the beginning of a, a political coalition where if you could split coal and oil on this by making the argument you made about the relatively more benign impact of the tax on oil could be quite interesting. Okay, um, are in coal or oil? I'm sorry? The, the coal, coal, oil. 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 Right. So then they have understood the economics. They, they'll probably get there. Uh, to, uh, the person to the right of Arvin there. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian Miller from the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, I was wondering if for developing countries, ones that um, have a lot of emissions from land use change, deforestation, and so on, do you have any thoughts about how the carbon tax could work um, towards them? I don't, I don't expect you to have an answer for that, but if you have thought about it. <laughs> I, uh, well, I do have an answer. It's a mess. Um, there's a very neat analytical approach, which is measure the stock of carbon, <laughs> figure out the change in the stock of carbon, apply the, the price or tax to that. But I think it's pretty clear that's extremely difficult because we don't have ways of measuring the inventory of carbon at this point. Uh, we might have using remote sensing. Uh, I don't know, some of you may be, have seen or been involved in remote sensing. Remote sensing is pretty precise. You can do a lot with remote sensing. And some of my scientist friends who do remote sensing say $10 million, they could actually do a pretty good, uh, they could develop a system that had a pretty good carbon inventory. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but, but maybe it is. But I think that's a very, very um, difficult issue. But could, could I just say one thing that I don't think it's widely known that might be interesting to you? Um, it's a question of, is deforestation lead to global warming? The presumption is yes. There were some recent studies uh, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences which say, not so clear. So the reason is, when you clear a forest, the what, albedo, technical term, albedo of the earth, the whiteness of the earth changes and it goes from dark, generally, to light. So from a malbedo uh, of maybe 0.1 or 0.2, so a reflectiveness of 0.1 or 0.2, if it's forest cover, to 0 0.5, 0 0.6, depending on if it's grass or crops or whatever. So a lighter surface reflects more sunshine and cools. So the question is, this is pure science, but I thought you'd be interested. Does the change in the cul in the light in the brightness of the Earth offset the carbon in the atmosphere? And the answer is, it depends on the latitude. And in low latitudes, it turns out deforestation is generally cooling. And in high latitudes, because the sun reflects, so if you, if you're hitting it head on then there's more bounce. And if you're in your high latitudes, you get less absorption. So it actually, the answer is we don't know. But it, it's, as far as I can tell, this has not at all been absorbed in the discussion of the deforestation and so the question you raised. So tropical deforestation, therefore? Tropical deforestation, you change the color, you get much more reflectivity, and it's, it's, for global it's generally a net cooling compared to high latitudes where, well, you think of the North Pole, it just goes right by, but you're not in the North Pole, but say, I don't remember, it's like 40, 50 degrees latitude, I don't remember the exact numbers. But it's actually an interesting, so there's a technical, there's a, there are two parts of that that make it very difficult. Okay, uh, let's see, the person immediately to John Williamson's left. Uh, yeah, no, oh, I'm sorry, next to you, to your right, right. I'm just trying to take it in order here, but. Right. Thank you. Uh, Stefan Kalbeck from uh, Brookings and Cicero. Um, I'd like to hear your opinion uh, based on the following assumptions. Uh, I, I agree on the first best global uh, tax, but given that we're unlikely to see global harmonized uh, taxes in the next few years, for certain, um, and that there is no world government, each nation can only make a choice for itself. 
so, so the situation each nation is facing is, given that my neighbors are unlikely to impose sufficiently high carbon taxes or taxes at all in the near future, what should my country do? Uh, it's a bit broader than the question of border tax adjustments, because you might have other answers like you exempt some sections, uh, se sectors, you set a lower um, tax rate, or, or perhaps you want to uh, focus more on um, uh, subsidizing R&D of green technologies, because that has a positive externality uh, and that might actually lead to negative carbon leakage. So in that kind of situation, uh, what's the best response for a country when its neighbors are not going to impose uh, efficient taxes in the near future? So um, I'm not, let me answer a little different. Let me answer a little different question. Ask ask us. Let me ask a slightly different question, which I, may help you or may not. <clears throat> Let's ask a different question. So I, I asked, what is in the simulations I showed you? The estimates is that if if we could all get together as a kind of cooperative equilibrium, so, and all decide, okay, we're going to take something that optimizes the response minimizes the net costs and damages and, and then spreads out the costs in a reasonable way, what we do. Okay, so let's ask a different question. Let's ask, what is the non-cooperative equilibrium? If each of us just does what's in our own national self-interest and ignores what other people are doing. So you look at a Nash equilibrium. Okay? And rough estimate is that the level of carbon price would be about one-tenth of the cooperative. So basically, it's not that you would do nothing, because there's some impact, but you do almost nothing. So I think the best response is just don't do anything, really. I mean, I mean that's, and, and I think the problem is that's a pretty good prediction about what countries are doing. They're doing nothing. Okay, thanks. Uh, in the back here, yes. I'd like to take a contrary view on harmonized carbon taxes from the point of view of political feasibility. Oh, sorry. Could you identify oh, I'm sorry. yourself? I'm Reed Dutchen uh, with the United Nations Foundation. I think that the attraction of these harmonized carbon taxes is, in fact, their political feasibility. We know two things about taxes. One is that nobody likes them except for the people who are in charge of the government. So that makes it more feasible rather than less. Taxes are generally liked by the people who are imposing them. Okay? So number two, it seems to me that the advantage of carbon taxes is that you don't need to have universality at the beginning. If you've got a situation, let's say right now, where the EU and Japan and, and Canada and pick a few other countries decided that they would lead the way, and imposed uh, a carbon, uh, a harmonized carbon tax within their economies with a border tax adjustment. It might even be a slightly punitive border tax adjustment. You could start to create a momentum where it's better to participate in the system than not to participate. And it certainly would create a different environment for the United States, which is the most recalcitrant and probably is not a good basis for us to be having this discussion. I think the U.S. is the outlier in this discussion and is coloring our views about this. But if, if the U.S. found that it was losing markets because other countries had this carbon tax system, and if the other arguments that you've made, uh, raise revenues or offset the Social Security Fund or whatever, uh, could be made, it seems to me that starts to make it politically attractive in the United States. I, I really agree with you. I would say, let me let me come back on this the issue of border tax adjustment, which you alluded to, and I think maybe maybe important. So if 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 you're if you think one of the most important things, you know, after preventing war and all those kinds of things that the world should do, is is make a dent on this problem, then I th I think the idea of a car. It doesn't have to be carbon tax, but I think it's easier, actually. A carbon tax plus border tax adjustments against non-participants is a pretty powerful tool. Um, and I think for just the kinds of reasons you were talking about, uh, there, you see, in the current situation, coming back to this Nash equilibrium problem, current situation, the bet for most countries, the best thing is to do nothing. Because you're actually, most countries, you're complying with the Kyoto, you, India is complying with the Kyoto Protocol. 
Mexico's complying with the Paris Accord because it says they didn't have to do anything. They can join and do nothing. But in this kind of scene, then, basically you do nothing, and there's a little penalty, as you said, and particularly if you're an open economy, as a lot of these countries are. So I think that's a kind of, that's a pretty powerful case. Now, the, it could be cap and trade rather than carbon tax, but in a way, I think in this respect, the carbon tax is advantageous because it, it's much more transparent and it's, it's, it's really clear what the border tax adjustment is going to be. How are you going to do a border tax adjustment? Remember those, that graph I showed you on the carbon prices in Europe? I mean, what are you going to do for carbon? I mean, you can do it, but it's a kind of nightmare. Is it last year? Is it a 90-day moving average? What is it going to Is it a, a, the futures market? What are you going to do to, to do it? So I, th I think that's a very powerful point. Okay, uh, let's see. Yes, for you, please, the person here. Yes. Uh, Joshua Meltzer, fellow at Brookings. Um, from Australia as well, as you can probably tell from my accent. And um, as you may be aware, you know, we've been going through a sort of a fairly extended process, not dissimilar to here, um, trying to implement our own cap-and-trade system. And um, what, one of the things that's... Um, and, and this request, this well, isn't it true you've been in, out, in, out? And I can't remember if you're in or out now. We've just been out, 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 out. <laughs> we're, we're, we're in, out. <laughs> <laughs> if if it's now? possible, <laughs> um, you know, wh one of the things I, I mean, back to this distinction between between going down a tax or a cap and trade route, and, and there was a lot of debate in Australia about it. Is, you know, is, is getting back to the idea of why we're putting a price on carbon, which at the end of the day is, despite the ancillary benefits, you know, about sort of climate change, right? And, um, you know, one of the things that um, you know was 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 seemed to be the case was that. Um, you know, I mean, you're talking about sort of price on carbon as sort of it can, the expectation, and I think this is kind of key, is that it's going to go up over time and it's you know, going to have to be around for a long time, right? And, and in, a, in a sense, it's the expectation of future prices um, which is going to drive the type of behaviour that you want to incentivise today. And, you know, that seems to me... There's two questions, I guess, to, to that for you. One is that, you know, given how hard it's going to be to get a tax up in the first place, you know, what, what are the consequences when you, you need to start ratcheting the tax up in response to, you know, worsening of the climate change and also the need to get the price signal out there? Um, how does that impact on future expectations if you know that it's going to be a battle all the time? Um, the, the, other, the other thing, and I guess this is sort of like a related question again to this idea of, of future price expectations, is that even though we didn't ultimately go down this route in the type of model we put together, um, is that with a cap and trade system at least, you know, particularly if you can create property rights in the permits, is you create a political economy around it where people actually, you know, essentially because they own property are invested in its maintenance and, you know, you get that long-term stability and, again, the expectation of future prices, which is really key to driving the type of behaviour you want. Well, I think those are good points. Um, I, I just emphasize two things you said, which are sort of arguing against my, my view. One is I do think part of the problem with with the tax system is you can you can repeal it. And uh, so you do worry a lot about how you're going to implement a system that's durable and doesn't you know doesn't get repealed every time you get an administrative change. So like the British steel industry, nationalized, denationalized, nationalized, denationalized. You don't want that to happen. I'm not, I'm not absolutely convinced that that uh, it's it's as bad as that because actually we don't usually repeal taxes. I mean, and in, in an environment of where we're so revenue starved, it, it's not. It, it may be less risk than normal. And I guess the other thing I'd add to that is. Uh, economists don't usually like earmarking, but I, I would say this is this is just tailor-made for an earmark tax, and, um, and it's kind of too bad you didn't do it for national health insurance or something like that in this country. And so you basically somebody who's arguing against against uh, the carbon tax would say, well, you're not just arguing against the carbon tax; you're arguing against my my benefits. Um, on property rights, I mean, this gets back to Tim's point, really, Tim Wood's point. Um, you you know I suppose if we spend enough money we could buy off all the lobbies, um, that does sort of that, I find that pretty offensive, and very expensive, um, and and a lot of revenues. I mean the, the revenues we're talking about with the carbon tax and Alan Alan Blinder scheme were 
were uh, more than 1% of GDP. So we, we, if we were allocating this, we would be allocating rights to 1% of the equal revenue, 1% of GDP. That's just, you know, we're talking about $150 billion. That's a lot of money to, 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 to kind of uh, calm down some the, the interest groups, and much more than is needed, as, as the point from Larry Goulder made. Okay, and uh, one final question, please. My name is Moffat Ngugi. I'm, um, I'm with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And assuming that uh, a, a carbon tax would be adopted, what's your comment regarding how a carbon tax, in contrast to any other option, would support adaptation and sort of coping, sort of economy-wide for, you know, uh, preparing for, for climate change and sort of uh, economic development in general, that, that's low emissions? I don't, I don't think it would actually do, I mean, first a proclamation would do nothing for adaptation. It's a mitigation option. Um, I mean, it could be that some of the revenues would be spent for that, but they might not be. I think the main, the main thing is that if, if you really have a powerful one, high, universal, durable, then you don't have to so much to you don't have so much climate change to adapt to, so I would say that's and I, I suppose that's pretty that's pretty good reason to do it, uh, but I think adaptation is a very local. Uh, this is a global initiative. This is this is trying to get at global emissions. Adaptation is it's different in in the south and the west, the east and the north, the uh, the coastal regions, the tropical regions, the Arctic regions, it's it's very, very local. But I don't think this is going to do much for it, other than perhaps uh, slow the problem down. Okay. Bill, thanks very much. It's been quite a session, fascinating, and uh, thanks very much to everyone who stayed for your patience, waiting to have your questions addressed. Um, it's been a great session, Bill. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, My pleasure. Very, uh, very instructive and stimulating. Chris, do you have any final thoughts. Uh, just, just to add my uh, thanks uh, to Bill and, and to all of the very, very interesting uh, comments uh, from all of you in the room, I, I do think that we've got a very, very interesting set of issues and, and perspectives that, that, that probably should deserve a lot more attention from all of us over the coming year. So again, thanks very much. Thanks. Thank you.